Enterprises today depend on hundreds of services working seamlessly together, but keeping them reliable at a scale is a constant battle. Service level objectives or SLOs help teams measure what really matters, reliability from a user's point of view. And Noble9, a leader in SLO management, has just launched SLO Oversight, a new capability designed to make reliability insights actionable across the organizations. And joining me today is once again, Brian Singer, co-founder and chief product officer at Noble9 to talk about what is SLO Oversight. Brian, let's start with the basics. You folks are announcing SLO Oversight today. What it is and why did you decide to build it? So Noble9's SLO Oversight is a a uh, set of tools that help make sure that SLOs are accurate and also owned and tied to the right business priorities as things change within the business. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we noticed going through adoption cycles of SLOs with our customers was that it's very easy for service level objectives and, and reliability work in general to become stale. So folks set SLOs up one time and then nobody really reviews them or it's hard to tell if they're still relevant. And so we really tried to address that with this set of capabilities. As you rightly said, SLOs aren't something you set and forget. They need regular review. But can you talk about why is proactive SLO review so important and what risks do teams face if they don't revisit or update them? SLOs are critical because reliability is critical. I think we all probably saw the outage that happened at AWS last week and the impact it had on a number of our customers, but really everybody through, throughout the, uh, uh, the tech industry probably. And one of the reasons that SLOs are so critical when things like that happen is it helps us understand the impact. You may not in that outage have actually, and we had customers where this was the case, there, you may not have actually, uh, uh, gone down, right? Your, your site or your, whatever digital service you're providing may have stayed up, but there may still have been impact to customers, right? Because maybe some of your other third party providers were introducing additional latency, things like that. So SLOs are critical because they give us the insight into when things happen, what what was the actual impact? And it's very hard to prioritize reliability work without having a really good set of SLOs that closely aligns to the customer uh, experience of using your product or service. AWS Outage is a great example here, but how does SLO oversight help teams collaborate better across engineering, product, and business units. What visibility does it create that was not possible before? Sure, so the core of SLO Oversight is an oversight dashboard that we're providing that gives both a view into the operational health of services, as well as the actual quality of the SLOs that are that are tracking those services. And that's a, that's a really key point, right? Not all SLOs are created equal. You can imagine where one team is using uh, service level objectives really effectively. They're reviewing them on a regular basis. They're determining, does this still reflect reality and what our customer expectations are? Maybe we need to loosen it or tighten it. And there's a number of things that can actually help inform whether that SLO is high quality, right? So think about, for example, a situation where an SLO is burning error budget for six months and nobody ever changes it, nobody ever fixes it, right? That's a pretty good signal that, well, nobody maybe is using that SLO, it might not be relevant anymore. Somebody might need to say, well, is this even an SLO that we need, right? Maybe, maybe we can remove it or maybe the definition needs to be changed or maybe it's we think that it's measuring something, but it's measuring something else. So what we're introducing as part of SLO oversight to help detect those quality problems is anomaly detection with for, for the quality of the SLO itself, right? So you can think about traditional anomaly detection is where I'm just looking at a signal and saying, well, did it go up or down more than I expected, right? Is it like a one, is it like a, you know, two sigma standard deviation type event? 
in SLO quality, uh, the sort of anomalies that we're looking for are those data quality anomalies. Did I stop receiving data for a while? This was actually something that happened in that, in that AWS outage, right? AWS goes down. You stop getting data from CloudWatch. That's actually another signal that, uh, that there's something unhealthy going on with my services. Um, and so, so the, the, the oversight initiative that we have is to basically try to take all of those signals we have about the quality of SLOs and automatically label SLOs if they are sort of high quality or they need review and then provide that feedback loop for teams to go in and say, all right, I have, I own 25 SLOs in my domain. Three of them are now flagged and they really need additional review. I mean, some might even ask, if we already have observability tools, why do we need a dedicated SLO platform like Noble Knight? Can you explain where traditional observability stops and where SLO management really adds value? And also, does it compete with or does it complement observability? Uh, SLO management really complements the observability tooling that's out there. And I think observability does a great job. And, and I think as an industry, we've moved forward quite a bit in terms of gathering a lot of telemetry. Um, but there's just so much data that it's very hard to determine which telemetry is useful and what it's actually telling us. And SLO management as a capability really adds the, the layer of trying to determine, you know, what is the actual impact, uh, to, to my customer experience, uh, when, when, various things come up like the AWS event or it there's a lot of everyday things right we're deploying new new releases of of software all the time and most of these are very interdependent on each other and the the change rate really informs where where a lot of the defects come come from um and and it's very hard to test for for you know all sorts of things until until it goes into production and gets a production workload um so SLOs help us with all of that. Now, the, the, the reason SLO management is so critical is exactly what you were talking about in terms of the coordination challenge. Uh, the adoption of SLOs requires a lot of standardization throughout, throughout a company in terms of, uh, you know, looking at them, making sure that they're relevant. Uh, they're not that useful. And I've seen this you know, in, in a lot of situations where one team might have adopted SLOs, but they have a lot of dependencies on other teams that haven't adopted SLOs or aren't using them as effectively. Um, and so the whole train kind of, kind of comes to a stop unless, unless everybody is sort of pulling their weight there. And what we've tried to do with SLO oversight is just make that process a lot easier. So there's less manual effort that goes into determining whether SLOs can be trusted. Um, and, and making sure that they have clear owners and those owners have the right tasks. One of the other capabilities that we're introducing that I'm really excited about is uh, review cycles for SLOs that are built into the into the, the the actual tooling. So you can see if I'm going to go look at the SLO for dependency, when was the last time this was reviewed and who reviewed it? Uh, and maybe it's actually due for another review. So you're able to set up those those periodic reviews. Like, of course. These are things that you could have live in other in other workflow systems, right? And and part of the reason that probably it took us so long to deliver capabilities like this is we said, well, look, folks are going to want to do that in Jira. Or they're going to want to do that somewhere else. But it turns out that having that information uh, right at the point of looking at the SLO was really really critical for adoption. And that so that's why we introduced it as part of SLO oversight. No, it's easy to get started with SLOs, but many organizations struggle to scale it across teams. From your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges enterprises face in adopting SLOs company-wide? Where do they get stuck and how can they build real buy-in? So we look at it from uh, from the through the lens of maturity um, and and we sort of see and actually if folks are interested on our website we have actually a whole uh, section on SLO maturity but it really comes down to the what I call the so what. You have SLOs so what and there has to be some enforcement mechanism right some policy that's driving the uh, the action around SLOs. 
Um, and in my experience, and I was actually talking to some colleagues at, at Google in terms of what they've seen as well, if there's no uh, action that's taken based on what an SLO is telling us, for example, if we're out of error budget, right, it doesn't have to be a draconian policy, but there has to be some policy and some action that's taken, then it's very easy for them to start to drift from their meaning and lose their meaning and they become just sort of noise um, that that's not adding a lot of value. And the challenge there is that if the SLO starts to drift from its original meaning or its original intention, uh, then we start to make decisions that aren't based on good data, uh, or we start to make decisions just based on intuition. And I think in our industry, it's really important to make decisions based on data. And, and mo most would, would agree based on that. So the, the policy is critical. And to get the right policies in place requires leadership buy-in. Um, so a lot of people have said, well, I want to start my SLO initiative bottoms up. That's important. I think it's important to get, you know, the first couple teams that are doing SLOs have to really understand them, have to be working in areas where there's critical services that are really important to the business. So that's where most of the value is going to accrue. But then there has to be that top down buy in to basically say, this is organizationally what we are going to do as a matter of policy based on what the SLOs are telling us. And when you, when you, when you're missing one or the other, that's when it's really hard to get the adoption across the entire organization. Can you also talk about what additional value does SLO offer that goes beyond solving technological challenges? We've seen a really rapid adoption of these concepts in the industry, which has been really exciting for us. Um, and, we see, you know, when we go talk to customers about the value that they're getting from SLOs, it's tremendous value uh, for, for, for both the, uh, you know, improving reliability uh, within the organization, but there's also a financial value, a direct financial value, because you're able to start to make trade-offs around where you're spending your money on infrastructure uh, more clearly. So even going down the road of turning off uh, uh, additional infrastructure if it's not needed, um, and then turning it back on. Um, we, we're seeing sort of use cases like that with SLOs, but it all hinges on the SLOs remaining relevant and remaining, uh, you know, ensuring folks are looking at them and reviewing them and they're going through these, these best practices. And so that's why we're excited about sort of opening up this new area of SLO management to, to the industry. And, you know, we're going to be probably doing a lot more in this space uh, in the in the months and years to come. Looking ahead, how do you see SLO oversight fitting into Noble Knight's broader vision? What's next for the platform and what's next for the role of SLOs in modern reliability strategy? You know, so we've been around for six years now. I, I, I like to say, like, we spent the first six years really solving the basic issues around plumbing for SLOs. Uh, and that's what you sort of saw in the first, I would say, generation of the Noble 9 platform. SLO oversight for me is really bringing about the second generation of the Noble 9 platform. And so it's, it's basically going from how do I do this, right? For a, for a single SLO or a single team to how do I drive real sustained value over time? And, and, and answering that basic question that we get from customers time and time again, how do I get adoption? I know that we need to be doing these things, but I struggle sometimes to get others on board with the vision that we have as an SRE team. And actually, I think it goes to what we see in a lot of organizations with how the SRE team is set up, the, the site reliability engineering team. A lot of the time, they do not directly carry the pager for uh, the services that they're, they're supporting, but they have responsibility for the overall reliability. So it's this really difficult, difficult job of figuring out where to spend their time and, and where to consult, um, but not actually having direct technical control of a lot of the underlying uh, software that's, that's running these systems. Um, and so we're really trying to partner with those teams to help make their, their lives a lot easier. And, and I think that's really the role of SLOs as they get better adoption throughout the industry is to essentially make it possible for SREs to do their job. Brand, thank you so much for joining me today and walking us through Noble Nine's SLO oversight. 
it is quite clear that keeping reliability measurable and transparent isn't just a DevOps goal anymore. It is becoming a business imperative. Thank you for sharing your insights, and I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you, Swapnil. And for those watching, if your teams are struggling to make reliability data actionable, check out Noble Line and its solutions. And don't forget to subscribe to TFR, like this video, and share it with your teams. Thanks for watching.